Good morning. Morning. How are you all? Fine, thank you. Very English answers, isn't it? How are you? Fine. <laughs> You'll be glad to know I'm fine as well. Jonathan, you fine? No. Jonathan is not fine. But because we're English, you just you, you glide past that, don't you? You'd be like, how are you? Not fine. Cool. Weather's been all right, hasn't it? Yeah. It's just our way. Well, we are um, we're concluding our sort of mini series of conversations that we've been hap happen happening, having. Um, let's just get my words going for a Sunday morning. Um, we're concluding our series of conversations that we've been having over the past four weeks that we have sort of um, had under the heading the dogs. Um, and if this is your first Sunday about hearing about the dogs, you might uh, feel like that, that sounds like a very interesting series title. Um, but it's based very loosely on an old piece of folklore where some elder is asked um, or says, I feel like that there are two dogs waging war within me, a good dog and a bad dog. Um, and then is asked the question, well, which dog wins? And his answer is, well, whichever one I feed. And he is, um, of course, referring to this sort of sense of inner turmoil that all of us feel in some way, shape, or form. And in fact, when you then start looking in the Bible, it's very scriptural, this war that goes on within all of us, this, the things we want to do and we don't do, the things we don't want to do that we do do. Um, and um, this, is, this is sort of what we've been exploring over the past four weeks is, okay, well, if the, there is this sense within us of spirit versus flesh, these two natures in conflict with one another, then how do we live a Christian life where we are feeding the good dog? We are feeding the dog that brings life and life in abundance as Jesus promised. And so over the past um, number of weeks, we first looked at the upward life. And if you'll remember, Tim and Henry and Phil talked all about prayer and worship and how these were beautiful and valuable tools at our disposal, not just on a Sunday, but on a daily basis to feed this dog of the spirit, to live the Jesus way. And then last week, Kirsty with Shirai and with Sue, um, they spoke about the outward life and they spoke about the value of serving others and living a life that is outward focused. And that in itself helps us in our relationship and our connection with God because the Christian life was never designed to be done alone or in isolation. And as soon as you attach it to community and serving others, something comes alive in us. The Spirit works in us and through us. And today we're finishing this conversation um, of the, the dogs um, with the inward life. So upward, outward, and now inward. 
Um, and we're going to have a little bit of a conversation about the Bible this morning. And so um, I'd love for you to welcome the person who I believe, other than sort of Jesus, knows most about the Bible um, on this planet, um, which is uh, Jonathan Speck, um, who has been part of our community for years and years and years, far longer than I have, um, is a lawyer, but is also an incredible man of the word and man of theology. So I'm excited to have this little conversation um, this morning. Um, this sort of stirred from um, the fact that Jonathan and I couldn't bore anyone to tears about the Bible. So we thought to ourselves, why not bore our church congregation to, cheer, to tears by talking about the Bible? Um, we both have, um, to be more serious, a deep, deep love of Scripture and are deeply convicted about the importance of understanding and knowing Scripture, um, especially in this modern, confusing world. Um, it's my opinion that if we are to grapple with the treasure hunt, the complex treasure hunt, that is the Christian faith. We have to know what to do with the Bible. I read a quote from N.T. Wright uh, this week, and he's talking about the Bible, and he says, it's a big book full of big stories and big characters. They have big ideas, not least about themselves, and they make big mistakes. The Bible is about God and greed and grace. It's about life and lust, laughter and loneliness. It's about birth, beginnings, and betrayal. It's about siblings, squabbles, and sex. About power, and prayer, and prison, and passion. And that's only in the first book, Genesis. <laughs> His point is a strong one. This is a rich, ancient, but living, incredible um, work of many um, painters, uh, prophets, fishermen, over a 1,500 year period. Like the Bible is complex, but it is beautiful. And we need to get to grips with it. And if we do as a community, and we think of it in this big picture of flourishing for the people of Jersey, if we are people that know the value of God's word in our life, then who knows what could God could do in us and through us. So I've got a few questions, which I'm going to throw Jonathan's way. And we're just going to kick off this discussion. And the first is this. Um, from that N.T. Wright quote, he talks about the Bible being a collection of good stories, uh, lots of interesting content in there, controversial content. Um, but is that all it is? Is the Bible a collection of good stories? Some would see it as just a book of rules, um, just, uh, yeah, an ancient collection of rules that don't really have much relevance to modern life. Some people see it as a nice ornament from uh, antiquity, antiquity, something nice to read. Um, what is scripture for? Are any of those close, or would you go further? Well, guess where I looked to find the answer to your question, Ben? The Bible, yes, I know. And the, the wonderful words of advice that were given by a mature Christian, very familiar with the word, to a very young Christian who was trying to run a church. And this was Paul writing to young Timothy in his second letter, and those of you who will know 2 Timothy 3 will recognize these words. All scripture is breathed out by God. It is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the person of God may be complete, equipped for every good word. I take three, five, three things. I always take three things from everyone. It's my cast iron rule. First of all, it's breathed out by God. It's what God has to tell us, so it must be important. Secondly, it's profitable. So it will actually be to my benefit if I pay attention to it. And then I understand it's to be used. What's it to be used for, yes, for doing lots of good works, but also it helps to make us complete. Complete. What does complete mean? Well, really, it means mature. It's all about our character. Yes, God is interested in what we do, especially what we do for him, but he's equally, perhaps some would say even more interested in our character, the people that we are becoming. So 
that then immediately shifts it. And it's very easy, I think, sometimes to see the Bible as a static piece of literature. Whereas what you're saying there is actually it's not static. It's something which has far more a sense of movement to it, a sense of, I guess, it causes us to evolve and grow and develop. And it has something, therefore, within it that we are going to now try and sort of, I guess, capture that actually leads us somewhere. So it's a a tool which helps us on a journey. Um, Dwight Moody, who was an American evangelist from the 19th century, once said this, which um, has always just stuck with me. The Bible was not given for our information, but for our transformation. And that, for many people, I think, is a shift. Because you can look at the Bible and say, well, I'm going to read the Bible to know about God. And, of course, there is much in there that teaches us about God. But if you start to think, actually, there is something in there that is more relational than that. It's not just a textbook to learn about God, but it is a way of knowing God and something that leads us then on this journey towards maturity. Suddenly, the Bible, to me, takes a completely different shape. It becomes something that we are engaging with that leads us on this journey. And you might have heard this term a lot in today's day and age because it's quite popular. A journey of spiritual formation. You see, this idea of character formation, as Jonathan's just mentioned, um, you can say, well, you know, I'm just, I'm just living my life. But the reality is we are all being formed by something all of the time. It doesn't matter um, whether it's like TV that you're watching or books that you're reading, music that you're listening to, the people you're talking to. Every interaction we have forms us somehow in some way. And the journey of spiritual formation is acknowledging that actually we can take control of that journey of formation and make it far more intentional. And scripture then becomes our, would you say, would you call it a guide? Would you call it a, I don't know, a sort of a pathway? I don't know. How would you describe the way that scripture takes us on this journey of formation? Well, let, let's take a, a step back again and get, guess what I'm going to do. Refer you to a passage of scripture, the longest psalm, the longest song in the Bible is Psalm 119. It's worth reading if you get the chance. But there's a very important part of it which sets the tone for what the word is all about. And, and this is what Psalm 119 opens with. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts, you Lord, God, have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes, then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. Now, I like all of that because it sounds like law, and I like the law. Hard as it is to believe, I find the law interesting. But when we hear whoever wrote this psalm, eulogizing about the law. We, we need to understand what is meant by the law. To the people who joined in this song at the time it was written, it meant the, the first five books of the Bible, the, the Torah. Uh, and the law, therefore, was scripture as it was then known, the Bible. The law is what God has to tell us. And so what do we take from that? What's the purpose of what the psalmist is trying to tell us to do? First of all, the psalmist says, know it. Know scripture. Secondly, they say, fall in love with scripture. And then thirdly, live it. Know it, love it, live it. That is what the psalmist tells us on behalf of God, what we should do with Scripture. So to finally come round to answering your question, Ben, it's not a set of rules, it's a way of life. And we'll, we'll explore that, I think, a little bit later. So 
God breathes it out, we breathe it in, and that then, that word, becomes the breath of life within us. That's beautiful. God breathes, God breathes it out, we breathe it in, and that becomes the breath of life within us. To me, and I think this is you know, where we want to start taking this, if we can move scripture from this just thing that we read to an act of relationship, which I think Jonathan has already started to hint towards, it just completely transforms the way that we look at scripture. And you see even the three things that Jonathan just shared there, this, the pattern from the psalm of know it, fall in love with it, live it. That in itself is a pattern of relationship, right? As we get to know someone, we fall in love with them. We can't fall in love with someone without knowing them. And as we fall in love with someone, that then becomes our pattern of life with them. So there is this, like, there's this relational journey. And I think one of the things that we need to realize is that the Bible leads us on this relational journey, but with God. It's actually a purposeful uh, method of connection with God. And it's not something of like, okay, well, when I go and pray, that's when I'm sort of connecting with God, but then I read the Bible to know about God. It's actually realizing, no, 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 they're all part of this same picture. It's all relational. It's all about connection. The more we understand and know scripture, the more we fall in love with the one who has breathed life into the scripture. Does that make sense? It's just taking it off the page into real life. And this is sometimes, I think, what we need to do with our Christian journey is realize this isn't just another academic pursuit. It's not just something that we just read for the sake of it so that we can sort of articulately or eloquently talk about who God is. This is, at its very core, um, a relational activity. And the Bible itself is all about relational connection. And so if, Jonathan, this is where we're leading, that this is about a formational journey of connection, of knowing God. It's a formational journey that transforms us rather than just being something we read about. My question becomes then, where is all of that leading? Like, what is the end goal in this um, character development? Is it just a character development tool, or is there something that it's really gunning towards? Well, the starting point is, what kind of character are we talking about? And there's a very easy answer to that. Surprisingly, God wants us to be just like Jesus. But how on earth can we do that unless we first understand what Jesus' character was, is, always has been? So that's in the Word. We discern Jesus' character from the words that we read about him. And that equips us to live in accordance with that character. And it's part of what are called the three tenses. You, you've heard this before, the three tenses of, of, of salvation, of our faith. What am I talking about? Well, firstly, you need to know that you are justified. In other words, you've been made right with God by what Jesus has done. Second, that, that, that's happened, it's done. It's it's been paid, the price is paid, you are right with God if you believe in Jesus. That's good news, by the way. Number two is what's happening now, the present tense of salvation, and that is called sanctification, a very long word which means being made holy, being made like Jesus, taking on Jesus' character in ourselves, so that we can live it out. And that's a long process. The only person I know who lives that out to perfection is Ben Blumel. <laughs> I'm a very poor shadow of his excellence. So, so but that's the, pur the purpose of this. It's not true, by the way. <laughs> Kelsey's not here to contradict me, so that's fine. But the purpose of this is to make us more like Jesus. And then, so that one day, the future tense of salvation I will be glorified in heaven. I'm going to be like Jesus. I'm not really very much like him, if you know me well, today, but I am trying. And I can try because I can read what's in the Bible. So the Bible becomes almost, well, the Bible describes itself as a lamp to our feet. 
but the lamp to, the, to our feet is on this journey of understanding that we are justified, of guiding us through being sanctified and leading us towards being glorified. Like, to me, this is where this stuff comes alive, because I'm like, ah, oh, there's, there's this big journey that Scripture is taking us on, and we can participate in this journey, and this is where the transformation happens with us. We're on this, um, whatever you want to call it, this pathway, this journey of spiritual formation to become more like Jesus. So there is a very practical outworking of everything that you find in Scripture. And this maybe is where it's worth saying, um, I guess if you're not careful and you sort of hear what Jonathan and I are sharing this morning, you can be like, okay, so Scripture is all about this journey of personal transformation. And it can become sort of quite an individual pursuit. You're like, wow, the, the Bible has got all of this incredible content in. Not only is this content good just to read, but it's actually living and active because it's breathed out by God. And therefore, I can read this and I can be transformed. It can become very individualistic. And yes, that happens as God grabs our hearts, convicts us, and transforms us. But I think crucially as well, just the sort of second side of this, this is not only about relationship with God, but it also becomes about our relationship with others. Because if we are becoming more like Jesus, this becomes then, I guess, our foundation for every other connection and relationship in our life. The more we become like Jesus, the more it affects our interactions with others. And this is where scripture then becomes not only an individual pursuit, but also a community pursuit. I don't know, would you have any comment on the sort of the outward working then of how this works? The more you understand the whole sweep of, of the Bible from Genesis all the way to the end, you understand it's all about the way in which God made us to have a relationship with him. God made us to have a relationship with what he has made, the whole of creation, and that therefore includes us having a relationship with each other. Let's, let's go back to the first rules. Let's go back to the first law, the commandments. They sound terribly tedious and difficult. Do this, don't do that, do this, do this. But that's not what it's actually all about. The, the Ten Commandments deal with relationship. They deal with who God is and how we relate to him. They deal with who I am and what I think about myself. And they deal with how I should behave towards you. It's all about relationship, not about keeping rules. But again, it's back to, to where I started. It's about a way of life that is the way God designed our lives to be, which is what we might call an, an abundant life. Because th th this is a way of life, the words that Jesus has given us. And Jesus said, word for word, I came that you might have life and have it in abundance, John 10.10. 10. That's the kind of life he wants us to have, but the only way to have an abundant life is to follow Jesus and the way of life that he has designed for us. Absolutely. And so, I, I, you know, what we're trying to do here is hopefully just shift perspectives on Scripture from this, like, okay, it's this old book of rules to realizing that this is a, something relational. It's something living and active. And yes, it does put boundaries around our behavior. And yes, it does put boundaries around our community. But it puts them there for relational reasons, for the benefit of individuals and for the benefit of the community. Because this, it is this way of life that is now God-given, that is transforming each and every one of us from the inside out. And it creates this God-reflecting community. Do you see how that pattern works and how it's so different from just do this and don't do that? But rather, it's about this journey of relationship and connection that bears the fruit of a community that looks like Jesus. Do you see that sort of different pattern and different pathway? And this, again, I think is where, because scripture can be pulled out of context and used for any old gain. And we've seen it all through history. Like you have the likes of Hitler using scripture um, to try and just back up what he's saying. You can pull, pull out anything from scripture because it's long. There's a lot in there. You can pull it out of context and you can make it back your way. But that's never what scripture was intended for. 
this bigger picture of relational connection, this journey towards spiritual maturity, and then the outworking of this with a community that looks like Jesus, that's where scripture finds its place. That's why the Bible says that scripture is living and active. But all of this so far has been reasonably conceptual. Um, Hopefully it's just sort of challenged your perspectives a bit. I think it's probably time now to get a little bit more practical for the last part of this um, conversation. And my first question to you is this. It's all very well and good learning that scripture is for our benefit. It's relational. It helps us to connect with God. It helps us to grow towards spiritual maturity. The trouble is, is it's not a particularly easy document to read sometimes. And often it can actually feel difficult and or almost impossible to try and understand what's going on in this thing. What do we do when we find scripture difficult? Give up. Excellent. Right and everyone answer. said, amen. Yeah. No. Let's welcome the worship team. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, what's the obvious answer? If I'm struggling with something, do I push on ahead in my own strength or do I look outside myself? Any suggestions there? Ah, so what do we need? We need help. Who do we ask for help? We have, we, exactly, Eddie, we have someone who's actually called a helper. And that's the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. And worth remembering that unlike the original disciples, Jesus isn't going to come and sit right next to me and explain word by word what his words mean. Or is he? Ah. So what did he say? I tell you the truth. If Jesus says, I tell you the truth, it's pretty important, so listen. I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you, and when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. We ask the helper to come and help us to understand that the words Jesus have given are real and vibrant and living, and to get a real sense of what lies behind them. So ask for help. Yeah, exactly. I've, um, I've heard it described, you know, if you were reading, say, a complex textbook, I don't know whether it was a, um, a book about science or something, um, and I, I say that because my parents are scientists, and um, I used to have to often read books about science that I didn't understand, but my dad actually used to write some of the like A-level syllabuses and exam papers. So when I was studying for my science exam, by the way, just um, as a qualification, he, I never did any of the exams he wrote. <laughs> I can see where you think this story is going, and it's not going there. My dad did not um, illegally give me answers to um, A-level exams. Um, but When I sat down and did my A-level science research, I had my dad, who was himself an author of the syllabus, with me. And therefore, when I didn't understand something, I could ask my dad, and because he would know what the syllabus was, he could give me the answer or explain it to me. And very similar to that is how the Bible describes itself with the work of the Spirit, is that we get to sit down with the Holy Spirit, who is God, the author, to go back to the first scripture that Jonathan quoted, All scripture is God-breathed. So if we have the Holy Spirit as our helper, it's like we are sitting down with the author and we are able to say, God, I do not understand this. And therefore, prayer and Bible reading always go hand in hand because you're saying, God, I, I need help with this. There's a lot in here that is difficult to understand. And if I'm just trying to do it in my own intelligence and in my own strength, I'm gonna miss the mark and I'm gonna end up confused. Whereas if I'm constantly inviting God into this process, saying, God, this, this is your word. Help me understand it. Help me know it. Because, by the way, the Bible is not just for people that are academically clever. And it has proven itself to be not like that for centuries. Actually, those who have often grasped the depths of Scripture the most, let's start right with the early church, were uneducated fishermen. They understood the word of God deeper than many 
Who did Jesus reach out to on the Sermon of the Mount? Those that society would have looked at and said, actually, these are the ones that don't know much, that are poor, that don't understand. And they were the ones that understood the kingdom of heaven. And therefore, if you're sitting here and being like, the Bible is beyond my level of intelligence, somewhere there, there is a misunderstanding because this is something that is applicable to all and any. And in fact, with the Spirit's help, whatever you consider your level of, let's say, worldly intelligence to be, that is irrelevant to the revelation that God can give you through his word. And it's just really important to remember that. So ask for help, not just from God, but I would also then add, or you can. Well, have a look around you. Who is sitting in front of you? Who's sitting to your left, to your right, behind you? Each one of those persons is a gift from God to you. Is that how you look at each other? It would be great if we did. What a community we would be if we regarded each other as a gift for one another from God. But he's given us each other to help us on this transformational life that uh, Jesus wants us to live. It's a community activity. Reading the Bible on your own is not what God wanted us to do exclusively. He gave it to us to share with each other, to like a meal, to enjoy, to, to consume it, to breathe it in, to understand it, to chew on it, to think about it. And it's, I find it's only when you try to express your thoughts, whether you write them down or speak them out loud, that those thoughts become clearer. So share. Absolutely. It's worth pointing out that especially in the early church and even before Jesus in the Old Testament, it was much more of a community activity in general than it would be considered now. It's only really our culture where we've gone quite far this way, and it's like actually your Bible reading is all in your personal time. If you think about Paul's letters, for example, they would have been read out loud to a community in, a various, in various cities across the, um, the ancient world, and that community would have then processed them together. And so this to me is always something that I'm like, we can work on this. This is why Bible studies and things like that are so valuable because all they're doing is they're encouraging us to process scripture together as a community. When you sit down for coffee with someone and say, right, we're not just going to talk about, I don't know, the latest sports results or whatever, but we're actually going to go deeper and talk about something in the Bible. What you're doing there is you're turning scripture reading into a community activity. And there is real value in that. It helps us as a community to navigate some of the deeper, harder, more complex parts of scripture. And you will never feel like um, you are by yourself in that. And so um, in order not to run out of time, and I think we've just started like pushing on this door already, but I just want to finish with starting to put together some takeaways because this is all about, as I say, uh, said at the beginning, it's about feeding the right dog. So how do we actually now start to incorporate rhythms of Bible reading and understanding and going on all of this journey? How do we actually incorporate that into our day-to-day living so that we feel like actually scripture is now becoming a big part of the this dog that I'm feeding day in, day out, that's feeding me the truth of God's word, that's reminding me of God's presence with me. How do we actually put that into practice? And one of the reasons that I really wanted Jonathan to um, be on this stage today is that um, a number of years ago, um, Jonathan resolved that he was not only going to read the Bible for himself, as um, um, as we've discussed, but that he wanted to make it a community activity. And I think, was it roughly six years ago? Maybe longer? Longer? Eight years? Ten years? <laughs> Nearly a decade, um, because I know this because I was still a lawyer in London when I started to receive these from Jonathan. Every day, Jonathan's got a whole group of people within his world that he does a daily devotional and he sends a personalized message to a number of people every day. Um, to encourage them in scripture, to share what he's read that morning, and to often share a short prayer for each person. And you have done it every single day, I think, for nearly a decade, because I've nearly been a pastor for a decade. So it must have been that long. And when I think of people that understand the value of reading scripture daily, Jonathan is the first person that comes into my mind, because I don't think I can think of a day that he's missed. I wake up, it's in my WhatsApp, usually sent around 6 a.m. Hi, Ben, how are you today? This is what I've been reading. This is what I got out of it. Um, And so my question to you, Jonathan, is how did you build that into your life? And how do you sustain it? And if you want a third question, what do you do when you don't feel like doing it? Because you must have those days. 
there are always going to be times when you don't feel like doing it. That's the same with anything we do. Um, so you remember who you are. Uh, and I'm a disciple. You're a disciple, Ben. Tim, you're a disciple. All of you are disciples if you believe in Jesus. And there's bad news coming. Being a disciple requires application and work. I don't want to make this sound tedious, but it's no excuse, it's no surprise that the word disciple has as its root the same word as the word discipline. So you do it. You just do it. And it becomes a joy as you do it, even when you don't feel like doing it. So push on. Perseverance. Perseverance, especially when you do not feel like doing what you know you should be doing, you do it anyway. And then it becomes a joy. Yeah, I think this is really important, isn't it? Like we, we chatted about this sort of little link that whatever you think about becomes what you desire. Your desires then become your actions. Your actions become your habits and your ha habits become your character. So if you start to feed yourself day in, day out with God's thoughts... This is the process of formation that we're talking about. The trouble is, is it's constantly being competed with by many other things in your day-to-day -day life, right? Whether it is the music you've got in your ears that is also discipling you with a certain way of living, whether it's the stuff you're watching on TV, the things that you're scrolling through on social media, all of these are giving you thoughts. And the trouble is, if your social media and your TV watching is your main sort of day-to-day -day input, they're the thoughts that become your desires. They're the desires that become your actions. They're the actions that become the habits, and they're your habits that become your character. Does that make sense? It's quite scary when you think of it like that. Whereas I think what I value in the way that um, Jonathan does it through perseverance, through doing it when he doesn't feel like it, is he just knows that if I can get God's thoughts and God's word in my head at the beginning of the day, these are the things that are going to become my desires, my actions, my habits, and my character. And that, to me, is a constant challenge for me to follow that same path. Because I know it's true, but it's sometimes difficult. I once heard, I think it was Bill Johnson or someone who said, you don't always remember what you've had for breakfast, but it still nourished you. Because sometimes you can think, well, um, I always forget. I read my Bible earlier in the day, and then by 2 p.m. I've forgotten what I read. But that, to me, always stuck out to me, that when you've put God's truth in your heart and your mind at the beginning of the day, even if you don't fully remember later in the day exactly what you read, it's still nourished your soul. It's still nudging your character in the, in the right direction. And it's not always easy. And perhaps in today's, today's day and age, this word perseverance is an important one for us because we're being assaulted from various angles by voices, ideas, opinions, ideologies. And we need to know and to persevere in God's way. Can I read Romans 5, um, 1 to 5? It says, since we've been justified by faith... We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, we rejoice in our sufferings. Challenging thought. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Scripture is our tool to follow this pathway. Whether life is good or life is terrible, whether you feel like you're suffering at the moment, if we can feed ourselves with the truth of God's word, then we follow this pathway. Sufferings produce endurance, endurance, character, character, hope. Like The Bible isn't just a nice to have on the sidewalk of our Christian life. The Bible is central because it is God's word to us. And I'm aware that we've only got a couple of minutes left. So, Jonathan, I'm going to ask for, I think, three conclusions or takeaways. I thought you said another couple of hours. I mean, I would love to keep chatting, but, you know, I, I fear for these guys out here if we were to, to get into it even further. Okay. Well, three things. I always, always like three things. First, enjoy it. Enjoy it. It's meant to be enjoyed, the Word of God. And if, like me, you find there are times when you're not enjoying it, find a way to enjoy it. Have three, four, five different sets of favorite passages that you'll go to 
words go back to them or or find a song which embodies your favorite scripture and sing it hopefully in private but, but perhaps when you're driving the car so first enjoy it second push on with it persevere don't give up because it's worth it and three don't do it on your own do it as community and talk about it chew it over with each other uh, because remember this promise that comes from I Isaiah 55 where God is talking about the word that goes out from his mouth it shall not return to me empty but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Amen. Amen. Can we say thank you to Jonathan? Um, there's so much there, and I'm going to ask the band to come and join me now as we, as we finish. Um, I love that scripture that Jonathan has just said. So shall the word that, be go that goes out of my mouth, it shall not return to me empty. And I don't know where you're at at the moment in your relationship with Scripture, but um, I feel like today could be a turning point. There's so much power in God's Word, and it is so accessible to us, more accessible, by the way, than any generation in history. We have this powerful, incredible, incredible tool at our disposal day in, day out. And yet the challenge, and we all know this challenge, is to actually engage with it and to engage with it regularly and to persevere with it. And so whether your challenge this morning is that you just struggle to read your Bible and you feel like you need God's help to sort of get you over the line to be like, actually, I want to make this a habit in my life. Maybe that's your prayer. Maybe your prayer is actually you know the Bible pretty well, but you're struggling at the moment with apathy. Perhaps for you, it's actually like, I just... I don't know, it doesn't feel like it's got the richness it once had. I read the Bible and it bores me and I know it shouldn't bore me, but it does. Perhaps for you today, it's sort of that God just lighting a fire in your soul again for his word and saying, God, like, I just, I want to open your word and again, remember what it is. Remember its power and therefore, like, draw me to it. That could be your prayer. Perhaps your elsewhere in your scripture journey you say actually I just find scripture so confusing I don't know how to interpret it I don't know how to understand it and on top of all the practical things we've talked about asking for help maybe that's just your prayer this morning of God reveal your word to me this feels like there's too much here that I don't understand so I don't know where it is but my hope and Jonathan's hope this morning is that wherever you are in your journey with God's word that this morning will have somehow just edged you one step forward to be like, okay, this is something I want to do. I want to do it regularly. I want to engage with this thing. I want to understand this thing. And I want to go on this journey of spiritual formation that Jesus is encouraging me on. So why don't you stand with me? Because I'm going to pray and I'm going to try and capture all of those things in my prayer. Um, and whoever you are and wherever you're at in your journey with scripture, can I just encourage you to give it a go this week, to get into it somehow and if you can't do it by yourself or you feel like you won't, then why not text someone or catch someone after the service and say, this week I want to go for a coffee. Let's talk about the Bible. And suddenly there's some accountability there. Whatever it is you need to do. But Father, Lord, we are so grateful firstly for your word. It is the lamp to our feet. It is the authority in our life, Lord. It shows us how to live and who to be. It points us to you. We cannot understand you, God, without engaging with your word. Your word is truth in a world that is so confusing. It is an anchor for our souls. And Lord, as a community, we do not want to neglect your word. We do not want to ignore your word. We do not ever want to try and live without your word. And so, Father, this morning, we welcome your Holy Spirit here. We know you are here to start ministering to our hearts. Lord, for those who feel lost in Scripture, 
Holy Spirit, would you be the helper this morning? For those of you who are feeling apathetic or bored with Scripture, Holy Spirit, would you light a fire in our souls that we might become desperate for your word, that we might realize how hungry we are for it, how much we need it in our lives. For those who are just struggling with the motivation, who have no rhythm of reading Scripture, Holy Spirit, would you start something today that echoes in the weeks and months to come? God, as we finish this morning in worship, we worship you for who you are. We don't just want to know about you, we want to know you. And this is why we cry out in worship. This is why we go to our Bibles, because we want to know you. You are here to relate to us, to connect with us. And we just honor you this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, everyone said, amen. Um, I just want to read this first verse. <clears throat> I think sometimes when you sing a song, um, you don't really take in the words, at least I don't. Sometimes I'm more in touch with the tune or the melody. But it says in this first verse, <clears throat> He became sin who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. So as we sing those words this morning, um, just take note of what we're actually singing this morning. So let's sing together.
what an encouragement from Jonathan and Ben today. And there's nothing that you can go out with that's more important today than knowing that the Word of God is your foundation. So as we go out, maybe there's a nudge to you today to open the Word again, to eat the Word, to be nourished by the Word, to find a community in which maybe a life group or uh, with a couple of friends where you open the Word together and you challenge one another and you hear from God. But in all of it, remember that the Holy Spirit is with you every time you read. And that's where we can get revelation that changes life, changes our lives. And so, Lord, I pray your blessing on everyone as we leave today. Lord, as we make the Word our foundation, Lord God, and ask you, Lord, to speak to people. Lord, unite people in reading together, in learning together, in growing together. Lord, I pray the blessing uh, that comes only from you. Uh, for each person who engages in that way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a great week, guys. Flourishing for the people of Jersey. Let's go.